It's Michigan time. Who here is not yet registered for the class? Wow. Excellent. Uh, I suspect you will be able to register without any problem. Uh, once the true nature of what I have <laughs> planned uh, is disclosed, which is the function of the class today, I think uh, some of you will choose to spend your time differently. Uh, and I think our capacity is 40, and there aren't nearly that many of us in here right now. And it was like at 35 earlier today. So does anybody have a uh, wait list? I heard from one person, two people, couple. OK. So at one point, the enrollment hit 40, and then you got waitlisted, and then it went below. And the system isn't smart enough to turn your wait lists into seats. But uh, long story short is you should have no problem getting into here. If you want to get into here, the question is, will you want to stay? Um, so uh, about that, uh, my name is Dan Klein. I have taught information architecture here at the School of Information for 11 years or so now. And uh, I have never taught it the same way twice. And uh, the bonus of doing it that way is that in a field as young as this one, the risk of uh, bringing things into the classroom that are not relevant is perhaps reduced. Uh, one of the major disadvantages to doing it this way is I can't reuse things from prior terms, which is one of the ways that people who teach uh, make it affordable to be a teacher um, so they don't have to spend inordinate amounts of time on it. Uh, but pretty much every time that I've taught this, I have the luxury to do it differently each time because this is not my job. <laughs> uh, teaching this class is uh, something that is a delight for me. It's a joy. It's uh, evolved into uh, many different things over the years, but uh, it is not the one thing that I am doing uh, in many ways, it's the thing that I fight like hell to have enough room to do because I enjoy it very much. And uh, once you come to learn about the nature of this enjoyment, uh, which puts a lot of work on you to figure out things that I don't know, um, that may not be the bargain that you signed up for. So there are at least uh, two models of teaching. Uh, one of the models is uh, the students are a vessel and uh, the teacher has something to pour into the vessel. Uh, the other model is that the teacher is interested in something uh, so much that it can boil whatever is in the vessel. And uh, uh, the model for this is more of the second thing than the first thing. Uh, so if you, for example, want to learn about, let's see if the slides work. This is a very strange setup. Um, if you are primarily interested in learning about the skills that are expected of people who know about information architecture to use them in a workplace setting where websites are, and software are being made, uh, what we're going to talk about this term is not really that. Um, and one of the reasons I feel the liberty to uh, not have it be focused on that is that there is this book. <laughs> I think I, you have a copy of it. Um, through the university library system, through the Safari Books Online subscription that all university uh, people have access to, there's a digital version of this book through the library system that you can get at. And uh, if you have a real tactical need to know how to do the information architectural things in a website or software building process, uh, get this book and read it and start doing the stuff that it says to do. Um, that will be just fine. <laughs> uh, this class uh, is more, uh, especially this term, the way that I've designed it, is uh, this is research. This is original research into the question of uh, what is information architecture and where are its edges. And uh, this purple version of the book, there is a green version of this book uh, those of us that love it, we call it the Polar Bear Book. We don't even use its title. Uh, this used to be a green cover, and it used to just have two authors' names on the cover, Morville and Rosenfeld, both of whom are graduates of this program. 
And it is not a stretch in any way to say that information architecture for the World Wide Web came from the University of Michigan School of Library and Information Science, or the, it was SILS then, School of Information and Library Studies. Uh, Moraville and Rosenfeld found a way to take what people who learn what you learn in a library and information science program, apply that to the making of complex websites for the World Wide Web, and that is what a lot of people think information architecture is, and uh, that is, to a large degree, the work of information architects uh, is not dissimilar from the kinds of stuff that you learn uh, as part and parcel in this program. So uh, I feel liberated from the need to uh, reify M MLIS kinds of thinking, uh, putting it into information architectural practice. Uh, you can get it from here. And uh, even better than that, this is now in its fourth edition, it has a purple cover, and the title now is not for the worldwide, worldwide web, it's for the web and beyond. And uh, that is what we are doing more of, is the beyond part here. Um, so in a lot of ways, this is uh, direct experimentation uh, into a dimension of information architecture that is not often, if at all, taught in iSchool contexts, which is the architecture part of information architecture. Uh, the architecture part of information architecture uh, has comprised much of what I have taught in this course over the years. Uh, this is a famous diagram of the subway system in Tokyo that was designed by Richard Saul Wormann, who is an architect, was trained by Louis Kahn, who is widely acclaimed to be one of the finest uh, architects uh, the United States ever produced. Uh, his thing about what information architecture is, and briefly back to the polar bear, uh, the structural integrity of meaning. That's one of the big frames of this kind of information architecture. That's really great. Hang on to that. Um, from the architecture side, what Werman thought architects could bring to the question of organizing information uh, was that there are ways that you can organize information the way that architects organize uh, systems and the parts of a building project or uh, a diagram for a transit system by making the complex clear. Uh, certainly not by reducing complexity. By embracing complexity and finding ways to use space, which uh, uh, Werman's practice in particular is exceedingly spatial. His practice of information architecture, a spatial practice, uh, that sense of it, I didn't get much of that from uh, the iSchool lenses, the human-computer interaction lenses, that this is a discipline about space. And so this course, this term, is largely original research into the work of a different architect, uh, the architect who built this, which is a school in Tokyo that I went and visited a couple years ago. Um, this is an investigation into the architecture part of information architecture, the spatial part of the architecture part of information architecture. And uh, even while the man who created the ways of thinking about architecture that this amazing 80-acre uh, campus was built on the basis of, Christopher Alexander, um, uh, even though he's the most well-known architect in software, I would say. If you've heard about an architect and you work in software and websites, you've probably heard about Christopher Alexander and something called Patterns. Uh, even though Christopher Alexander's uh, books are the best-selling books, uh, the imprint for the textbook for this course, this term, Oxford University Press, they publish any number of books. The best-selling book on their imprint is by this architect, Christopher Alexander, uh, whose work has not been well translated, is my argument. It's been grappled with by software people, uh, mostly of a generation or two, uh, back from today's contemporary software practice. So software has tried to take on the work of Alexander and what it means, uh, but information architecture and what this, uh, this man's radical theories about space uh, have to, have to do with the kinds of work that we are mostly, all of us in here, uh, I'm not blind to or ignoring the fact that many of us, if not all of us, are gonna end up working in 
complex information environments, things that end up on screens, designing systems uh, for people to use, connecting people and information, I believe that's still the uh, tagline of the school. Uh, I realize all of that, but I don't think it is a, a waste of all of your time for me to recruit you to be uh, designers and conductors and participants in original research to test this person's theories about space on uh, the space where complex information is. And uh, I became compelled to bring this into my teaching practice uh, only after having visited this place in Tokyo. Uh, prior to that, uh, like many people who are working in uh, digital, broadly, let's call it working in digital, if you are interested in architecture and you work in digital, you have to have grappled with uh, put your little toe in the pool of Christopher Alexander at some point. And uh, to be honest, and I don't mean to use that turn of phrase to say that the other things I'm going to say are not true, uh, but to be honest, because it's a little bit embarrassing now, uh, in hindsight, the reason that I touched so lightly on Christopher Alexander's work is because I don't like to do hard things. I, I don't. I, st I, I was lucky enough to stumble into when the World Wide Web became a thing in about the year 2000. I was in library science and you can be a web designer, you can be a whatever you want. So I just magically floated into a wonderful career that I really love. Uh, so it's not really been hard for me to get to uh, work on really amazing things, uh, systems that touch uh, hundreds of millions of people. Uh, so I haven't had to be good at hard things. <laughs> uh, your generation, though, the rigor now that uh, has been brought to working in digital, uh, if my generation got to skirt by with uh, charm and uh, good luck, uh, you don't get to do that. Um, and so I was hesitant to waste your uh, forerunner's time, the people who sat in those seats in years prior to this one, um, thinking I might be wasting your time talking about the theories of someone uh, when those theories are predicated on uh, a cosmology that is completely the opposite of what uh, most, if not all of you, would come to the course with. Uh, Christopher Alexander is reviled by architects. Somehow he is the best selling, maybe that's why, jealousy. Um, uh, but the people who buy his books and who are crazy about his work don't tend to be architects because what he's talking about um, is a nice, if you take it sort of metaphorically, yeah, wouldn't it be nice if there was a timeless way of building? Uh, there is this lovely prosaic uh, set of these lovely yellow books that you can. Uh, have the feels when you read them. And then you can go design a database table better as a result. Uh, I was hesitant to bring this in because what it's predicated on is a completely different cosmology than the one uh, that you all are supposed to be learning inside of. I believe that we received this from Rene Descartes uh, 400 years ago or so. Uh, the Cartesian world of carving up the world into a grid and that uh, the scientific method is true and that your feelings are an aberration. Uh, there are, uh, in order to take this stuff on seriously, you have to entertain a lot of ideas that are not welcome in the academy, uh, just broadly. Uh, there are matters of academic freedom uh, where somebody waving a bossy finger saying, there is a correct way of going about something. Uh, I didn't want to waste, you only have 13 or 14 weeks in these, why would I waste your time with something that would require you to uh, think about an opposite cosmology um, when there's work to be done out there and uh, you need training in order to do that work. And presumably the architecture of information uh, in all of the other ways uh, would be good for you to know. Um, but then with the author of the polar bear book, uh, Peter Morville and I uh, got to go to this thing in Japan and our hosts were so gracious, we mentioned that we would like to go to here. Um, 
did, had no idea that it would take three or four trains and a whole, like an hour and a half of travel to get, when somebody says it's in Tokyo and okay, and you're in a part of Tokyo, it's like, okay, well this other place is in Tokyo, can we go there? And they busted, uh, they did backflips to get us the hour and a half to get to this place. And uh, sadly the students were not there, so I didn't get to have a sense of the life of uh, what it's for, which is learning, uh, and people going to school there. But the experience of going to this place, um, it's a total environment, and to be completely surrounded, uh, and this was built in the mid-1980s, so these are not ancient uh, buildings, but they have a feeling to them, and it really does start with that, uh, the way that these places work, um, it's extraordinary. And I don't think that it is uh, impossible to ask uh, if these kinds of architecture can have that kind of an impact on people. Uh, starting with my own subjective experience, uh, adding to it the stories that we were told by the vice principal of this school, who talked about uh, students who had behavioral problems at the schools that they attended prior to here. Uh, behavioral issues sort of just evaporating uh, after a week or two of being in a total environment that is uh, every single inch of it uh, meant to be good for people and meant to be an environment where learning is uh, uh, beautiful. And, uh, and so I had a firsthand experience of that uh, it caused me to want to dig into it more, and I have since uh, read thousands of pages because there are literally thousands of pages of these yellow. Uh, there's some blue books also to read uh, from this man's life work. Uh, about 50 years of relentlessly publishing about this uh, way of working and building. Uh, and so the central premise of this course um, is that, uh, how did I say it? The rules that govern what's more and less good to do with the situatedness of things in space are operative at every scale and in every kind of space. Uh, Alexander makes these seemingly preposterous claims about uh, the nature of everything working according to certain rules, uh, certain laws, certain ways of putting stuff together in space, and once I started uh, uh, first by going to places that he built using these principles where the density of these principles is intentional and it's just overwhelming, and then going to other places. Uh, this is a chapel in Dallas by uh, Philip Johnson. Uh, and then you look at some of the oldest things that people have made, uh, 35, 34,000 years before the Common Era. Uh, what is the basis for things that are beautiful? And finding out uh, that this man has spent his whole life's work uh, trying to figure out what is the basis for things being beautiful? Uh, as a mathematician, as an architect, and finding that the nature of order that he learned uh, in school, uh, like the rest of us, uh, wasn't adequate to encompass this. The explanation for what makes all of these good things good uh, goes beyond function, and uh, the chopped up Cartesian world, as far as he's concerned, doesn't have the answer. Um, and that it isn't just about, um, that it could be like the performance of a piece of music. This is a picture that I took at a ski hill in Grand Rapids near where I live. Uh, the way they put together the band shell, why did they put it there? Its position relative to where the people are, the way that the people just sort of decide to sit together, um, that there is an order that is discoverable, testable, that is real, um, that we simply have been trained off of being able to understand, detect, or use effectively, uh, because it is uh, orthogonal to the fundamental construct of our education, um, which is that space is neutral, that you can do anything that you like with the parts of things to make other things. Uh, and the argument uh, that Alexander is trying to make 
is that there is a way that this comes together, an order that can describe the performance of the music, uh, that can describe the joy of the people, that can describe what is more and less good to do with the situatedness of stuff in space. And uh, the part that I'm uh, obsessed with, that I'm projecting onto it, um, that I have not been trained off of by uh, the people who are uh, closest to Mr. Alexander, is that uh, this, it's, it's in all kinds of space. Uh, he's will, he wants it to be the same order that describes a music performance or a built environment where people are. Uh, why not the space of uh, where we play games? Why not the space of what's happening in interfaces? Why not the space of what's happening in uh, any complex information environment? I want to know where the edges are. Uh, one of the really compelling arguments that is made in the four volume work, The Nature of Order, is that uh, we have ample evidence of the thing, of what things in space already want to do. Um, and not just the super sort of uh, spiritual discipline to listen uh, closely enough to the wonder all around for the evidence of this. But like, uh, for example, metal shavings in the presence of a magnet. How do you explain what is going on there? Uh, what Alexander wants to be able to do is have this theory explain everything. And it is compatible with quantum theory uh, with the bleeding edges of other disciplines' investigations of space. And so that's what this is, in part, is uh, investigating. Uh, it's not a bleeding edge, it's like a rusty edge. This is work from the 1980s and 90s that people in our field uh, didn't, it's too hard to do, so we didn't want to do it. Um, so this is working at the rusty edge of uh, how this concept cuts through uh, what the rules might be for what you do and the idea that the same principles for structure, for the situatedness of the things that are alive. Um, and this definition of life uh, encompasses things like rugs and uh, tiles and uh, things that we make, uh, that there is life uh, in everything and that the situatedness of things in space is a recipe for making things be more alive. And uh, that we can learn how to do that and that we don't need experts, uh, that we already know how to do this, and we would just need to listen to our feelings in order to know how to do this stuff. Yes? I have a question that may be like too early. Sure. That's okay. very focused on context and argues that things are often radically different and that you have to take each situation and look at its individual context and its uniqueness. Otherwise you miss things, you miss the needs of just people. Like, so this is kind of hard for me to grok, <laughs> like get my head around. Oh, it gets worse. Because, It'll yeah, get worse before it gets better. Oh, yeah, and <laughs> I, and when those concerns start to percolate, uh, please say so. Okay. Um, there is an immune response to this kind of thinking. Uh, it sounds like it could be a uh, one size fits all. And hopefully I will be able to explain it to you well enough that uh, that won't be, there will be many other bases upon which you will object. Okay. Uh, I don't think that will be one of them. Okay. This, uh, if anything, is the opposite and it enshrines 
the differentiation of space hyper uniquely for context, while at the same time talking about patterns that are uh, beyond uh, specific context. So uh, like many utopian uh, theories, it tries to have it both ways. <laughs> Maybe not cool though, so, uh, so, so, so we, have to, we have to hold this somewhat loosely. Uh, and this would be a good time for me to introduce to you Kat King. Uh, Kat took this course a number of semesters ago and uh, is somebody who's really interested in information architecture and someone for whom these theories really don't sit well or right. And uh, she has agreed to help me uh, teach this class. This is the third or fourth time now. Uh, so the healthy skepticism is part of how all of this has to happen. Um, so I had a personal, um, I started to say subjective experience when I first shared that I went to this place in Japan, but um, the more that I think about it, it was, uh, I'm not sure it was the subjectivity of the experience, more of the uh, sort of catching my breath at thinking, uh, if this is true, what does it mean? because I believe that it's true having been there. And uh, what if we could make things for uh, screens that are mindful of how things want to come together? What if the situatedness of concepts in our ideas are subject to the same kinds of principles that makes one of these more able to be alive? Uh, I make ideas. Uh, some of the distancing that I've had in trying to adopt this work of Alexander's is the, uh, the built worldness of it, the seeming requirement that this is about making stuff. Um, so the big reach in this course, one of the central uh, conceits that if you can't go there, uh, you probably shouldn't be here, is that uh, space is space. And that the what fundamentally what's happening with this, uh, fundamentally what's happening with this, um, is also relevant to uh, how I put an idea together. Uh, I have the great pleasure of having gotten to know uh, Christopher Alexander's wife a little bit, and I met with her shortly. It was a day or two after the Brexit vote, and uh, she greeted me almost before I was through the threshold, saying. Uh, this Brexit thing was an information architecture. That, that's what went wrong here, right? Uh, the situatedness of those ideas in space, uh, I will, a uh, prov bit of prov provocation, wasn't even planning to talk about this, but I'll just put it out there. The situatedness of those ideas in space, it was set up to fail. Uh, Remain was set up to fail because uh, the situatedness of that concept relative to the concept of Brexit the language they put on it, um, that is an architecture of information. So uh, I want things to be alive. I want more and better complexity of human cultures. Uh, uh, a vote for xenophobia is less alive. What if they structured their idea so that it, the idea itself was alive? Uh, underneath it all, uh, for a long time, he hesitated to give it a name. Uh, in the maturest part of the work, uh, he then is comfortable calling it wholeness. What is this structure underneath everything, the fundamental uh, real structure that when we talk about the situatedness of things, uh, if we're doing that in a way that is toward wholeness, we will be able to make things be alive. And that the orthogonal thing that most everything else in the world, the reason we can't have nice things is because the world of Descartes the last 400 years has been executed in terms of partness. And this is the way of wholeness. And so investigating just what the hell does that mean? Um, and uh, the argument is usually made in terms of buildings when examining this work, right? You can look at two buildings next to each other. If you've ever been to Chicago, this is a really amazing juxtapos juxtaposition of Mies van der Rohe's IBM Plaza uh, right next door to his student, uh, Bertrand Goldberg's Marine, Marina City. Um, which of these is better? Oops. Which is better? They're right next to each other. Uh, granted, they don't have the same functional purpose, but the ability to have a systematic rationale for saying 
uh, without it being personal preference and my own uh, particular taste uh, that one or the other of these is better because reasons. Those are the reasons that we're going to investigate together. And uh, very eventually getting to, so then it also applies to this sort of thing, right? Uh, if you were able to take what somebody posited as uh, a system for knowing uh, what good is, so here is a picture of part of the stack. Um, I'm going to try to, as quickly as possible, so the first, the next two class sessions are the delivery of this theory uh, by me to you, um, pulled from this huge stack, thousands of pages, and using some archival material that we have permission to use, uh, which I think is one of the clearest explanations of it. Uh, we're going to use it and test it, and then you will have the ability to reflect, reflect on it as an individual. Um, but we're not going to make uh, interfaces or pictures of interfaces or task flows or wireframes or do. Uh, uh, we will do something akin to card sorting. If you were really hoping that we could do that, um, we'll do something akin to that. So um, what are we going to do? There are any number of ways that I intend to use you all to test this out for me so that I can understand it better. Uh, along the way, you will probably enjoy yourselves, but that is not a guarantee. Um, so firstly, uh, and because the primary text about this uh, theory is this archival thing from 1982 that uh, is in the files section of the course website, uh, because we're using an expression of that theory that Alexander did as a speech at Harvard in 1982, uh, I'm using a list of these properties of the wholeness from about that time. Your textbook for the course, uh, and you do not have to buy a new one of these. There are enough people who bought this and like, what the hell? And uh, Amazon used, you can get as many of these as you like very cheaply. Um, there is a list of 15, there's only 12 here. Uh, in the more mature work, there are 15 of these properties. It doesn't really matter. Um, we're gonna focus on these and so you will be paired up or put in tr trios or uh, Quartets, depending on how many survive the great uh, oh my godness and uh, unregistration that will happen after this after we meet today. Um, however many of you are left, hopefully there will be at least enough of us to pair up on these. Uh, Christopher Alexander put in an inordinate, inordinate amount of work in the first part of his career uh, writing something called uh, Pattern Language. Has anybody seen that book? It's like about that fat. A Pattern Language. Um, that was based on all sorts of research into human well-being in the built environment in Mexico and a couple other places, Peru, I think, also. Uh, there's another book called The Timeless Way of Building that we are, have an excerpt of in the files section for the course. Uh, all of that work of his in the 60s and 70s. Uh, other people started to do it that way. Other people influenced by that work started making things. <coughs> Excuse me. Including Alexander. And uh, he was disappointed that on the basis of the pattern language alone, which he thought uh, would probably help people make living structure, uh, people who used that book ended up making structures that had a rambling kind of funkiness to them. Uh, they would have alcoves aplenty, and they would have window seats, and uh, there are some like... Uh, Precious moments, uh, ways of reading Alexander's work that would show up in these structures, but they lacked, they didn't have a, uh, the, the physical structure wasn't good yet. And he was pretty bummed out by spending, you know, 25 years working on this stuff. Other people apply it and the stuff they make isn't good. And then he would apply it and then what wouldn't be satisfied with his own work applying these ideas. And what he started to get into, uh, and this is where we pick up the work after the stuff that most people in software have focused on, which is pattern language in timeless way, uh, that there is something about the geometry that is uh, lacking and that there is something systematic about the geometry that can be understood and applied and used both uh, heuristically to try to figure out uh, that purse. Is that purse good? Uh, 
you could use these principles of geometry to look at the shape of the handle, the silhouette of it, uh, its width relative to its height, uh, that anything that is situated in space, that its geometric uh, properties, the more it has these properties, the more and better it will be part of this uh, uh, living structure. And to the extent that there are things in the world, made things that we uh, don't like very much, like this clicker, um, I don't find this to be uh, beautiful or good. It's a means to an end. That uh, I could use these principles to get at what is it about this that needs to be better in order for, again, if my basis is that it's more beautiful and it's more about wholeness and more about being alive, then there are interventions that I can make using these geometric principles uh, to this object. And uh, so I'm going to at least pair, if not more, you up. On these principles, uh, I will give you the circa 1983 description of them uh, when we meet next week, and uh, you will spend some time using these as one of the ways to test this theory about space. Uh, using a principle, digging into one of these principles, and then telling us, uh, the rest of us, about it. And we'll have coverage of all the principles then, because we will all have paired up, learned about them, talked about them. Uh, another thing that we're going to do to test this theory of the order of space is uh, semantic space. Uh, that may be the most naturally iSchool category of space. Uh, in terms of what this uh, you're, we're using as the, the material of focus, uh, which I probably should have gotten around to before now, but it's, as you all know, the films of Wes Anderson. So the semantic space, the text of the script of this film, is widely available. Uh, taking that as a data set and using semantic analysis on the text of a film to understand uh, the order of space and if there is something about the situatedness, uh, the co-occurrence of terms. Here's a real quick one of Max and Mr. Bloom. There is a, uh, uh, is it a heartbeat? What is it? There's something about the structure of the repetition of their names in the corpus of the semantic space of the script of this film, uh, how does Alexander's theory about the order of space uh, relate to us understanding the semantic space of uh, some of these films? Uh, so one group will spend uh, a lot of focus on semantic space and will design some sort of a test that we can do together in class to uh, build some data to uh, understand some patterns about semantic space and whether or not uh, semantic space in these films uh, lines up with what Alexander says uh, is good. And we can also along the way bring in some other normative criteria for what makes a good semantic space. Uh, similarly, uh, and again I've never done this before, I don't know if any, if, uh, any of this will work, uh, the order of space is supposed to apply equally well to uh, uh, multimedia experiences. So uh, a group looking at the sound design in Rushmore, and then design an experiment for the rest of us to do to test out uh, how does the order of space apply to sound. Uh, and then uh, all of the rest of you in your individual film critiques will uh, have the opportunity at least to talk about sound as well as semantics as one of the kinds of space. Here's another one, uh, color space. I have some uh, unpublished uh, things from Christopher Alexander on color and the order of space that I'll give to whoever is investigating uh, this uh, deeply. What does what Alexander says about the order of space have to do with the use of color in these films? Uh, I suspect it has something to do with it, but I don't know. That's what you're here for. Um, and then lastly, this is a 10 cent word, diegetic space. Uh, I'm teasing this out from the semantic space, and some of you uh, who know about these things might want to uh, uh, have an argument with me about it, and I'd love to have it. Uh, this is the structural space of the story. This is the world of the story space. I'm thinking that its properties are probably different, or at least we could tease it apart, uh, and that's a different matter than the semantics. Semantics being... Uh, 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 words to create meaning, and this is well beyond the words. This is the space of the story. So somebody drew a diagram of 
some of the character mappings in Shakespeare's Othello, um, mapping the relationships of characters, or uh, this is a really groovy one that uh, everyone will have a chance to do if you like. Good fortune, bad fortune. Start, end. Uh, this is uh, Kurt Vonnegut's theory, this was his master's thesis, that all story space can be diagrammed uh, and that the basic structure of every story is get a guy in trouble and get him out. Um, and that there is a way to, and if we took all of the different films that we'll be looking at in here, uh, that there would be a different shaped wiggle, maybe, maybe not, uh, and that the shape of that wiggle, what does that have to do with Alexander's theories about the structure of things in space? Again, don't know how much it does, if at all, but I suspect there's something there and that it's worth uh, knocking around in here. Uh, another thing that we're going to do, uh, this object analysis. Uh, on Halloween, we, have, uh, we get to meet together on Halloween, which is a Monday. So uh, I'm going to come dressed as the rat from... Uh, uh, fantastic Mr. Fox, you all are welcome to turn it into a costume party with me, but I will be uh, at least wearing a striped sweater. Um, uh, potentially. Um, and what we will do, I will sh uh, we will have a fun activity which is called the Mirror of Self Test. Uh, there's a backpack and there's a salt shaker. One of these things is more like your truest innermost self. And if we isolate you and have you uh, evaluate two objects, and it doesn't matter what the objects are, just that they're different objects, that anything that is made in space has more or less of this structure in it, the structure of wholeness. And so we will, uh, in the class on Halloween, we will all bring in a bunch of objects and we will see if it's true that uh, everybody agrees. Um, what are the objects that have more and less life? That's interesting to do. Um, and then each of you individually will also pick an object. Uh, a piece of tile, a tea tray, a salt shaker, and use uh, the Alexandrian analysis to talk about an object and, and why it's good or not good. Um, so you'll do that individually. And I think the points add up, but again, I've never done this before and I'm uh, an English major, so there may be some flaws in the scoring uh, math at this point. Um, we will expose those as, we've, as we roll, but uh, the cement here is still wet. Uh, this is what I think we will do. Uh, this first group is you and another person or two talking about one of these geometric properties and then uh, talking, presenting that back to the rest of the class in a short presentation. That's 20 points. Uh, the next thing would be uh, breaking you into six groups. We have six Wes Anderson films uh, that aren't Rushmore that each of you will look at. And you can apply all of, as much or as little of the Alexandrian theory as we've got to uh, those films. But taking on the whole film as a complete work, uh, how does how does this film stack up along the Alexandrian scale? And then the bonus round, ideally, uh, especially in terms of the structure of complex information in this film. Uh, we want to make this as information architectural as possible. Uh, so that's 20 points. And then the third 20 points is the uh, deeper analysis, uh, a group on sound, a group on color, a group on semantics, and a group on diegetic space. And uh, Half of the presentation just sort of telling us uh, what your investigation was, and then the other half of the class. Some sort of uh, experiment that we can do in the room with the people who aren't your group to test your theories about your dimension of the investigation. And then uh, the individual work, uh, adding up to 35 points. Weekly readings. There is a little box you can type a question into. I have extended the period. Uh, that little box for today was going to go away tomorrow, and I made it go until Saturday, I think. But uh, there will be little weekly readings and asking a question, and then I bring that in as a um, conversation. So weekly readings. Uh, there's, a, like I said before, this object critique, something that you think is good or not good, and using the theory to describe it. Uh, your participation in those sessions where your colleagues, uh, who, like you, don't know anything about sound, let's say, but worked hard to understand it, presented something to you, and then made you be a test subject, made you probably listen to something. Uh, you being a willing subject, you get points for that. And then uh, the last class session is a open book, open computer if you want. 
<coughs> excuse me, probably don't need it. Um, uh, reflection time. And uh, I think that adds up to 100 in 13 weeks. Does it add up to 100? 105? 95. 95. Okay. I can think of something else to do. <laughs> we'll, we'll find a way. Um, so the everybody for today, and if you are new and you didn't register, you didn't know, uh, watch the movie Rushmore. That is going to be the uh, lingua franca for this course. Uh, that is a film that everybody agrees is good. And uh, starting with a complex information world that everybody agrees is good, um, and if you find you know valid critique that it's not good, let's bring that in for sure. But that's uh, all of these films are presumed to be good, and all of these films are complex information spaces. Is my uh, very wide uh, uh, <coughs> conjecture for this course? So some of you will look at a stop motion animation film, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Uh, I think this is my favorite Wes Anderson film, um, but I don't think it's his best film, The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Uh, Moonlight, Moonrise Kingdom, which is uh, heartbreakingly beautiful. If you are uh, someone who cries at beautiful romance movies, boy-girl things, this one is not for you, because uh, you'll cry a lot. Uh, Grand Budapest Hotel, which I think is his master work, the fullest realization of his every uh, imaginable uh, exertion of control over the complex information world. Um, the Royal Tenenbaums, which is really uh, complex and funny and sad. Uh, and the Darling Dodger. Can somebody say that? Jar Darjeeling Limited, uh, which is quite sad and also uh, beautiful. Um, I have come to understand, and I have not confirmed this yet. But there is some sort of a thing in this building, maybe upstairs from here, uh, where there are viewing stations and Blu-ray discs of all these films. Uh, if you have a, if you, it shouldn't be possible for you to not be able to find a way to watch these films. Is what I'm saying. Uh, somewhere in this building is a thing that is supposed to have <laughs> is. Uh, what's that? Okay. And is it on this? I always get confused because it's like if it's a number two number, I always think it's on the second floor. But okay, so maybe it's on this floor, but somewhere in this building, a resource that is supposed to be available to students. Uh, and I looked on their website, and they have supposedly the script of all of these films and the film of all these films. They're also on all the streaming things. So I doubt you will have a problem. Uh, viewing these and through the Canvas website for the course, you've been put into groups already. And I don't think we want to, like, it's just tough. Like, if you wanted to be in a different group, uh, tough. Uh, the textbook is Battle for the Life and Beauty of the Earth. And it is the story of the building of that uh, combination, at least at the time it was designed, high school and college in Tokyo, the one that completely blew my mind and made me have to change everything that I think about everything. This is the story of its uh, having been built. And the first piece that we will focus on is the fourth section. There are internal divisions called books, which is, uh, we can debate the helpfulness of that as an organizing construct. But uh, the fourth part of this book is the one that we'll focus on initially. And then for the final exam, uh, going back around and reading the rest of it. Yes. I'm really sorry. I'm looking at the assignments and the reports, and it looks like all of the reports for me. Um, yeah, that's probably us not knowing how to use the Canvas site yet. So okay. you will only be given one. Okay. You don't have to do all those. That, that looked intense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, at least I won't speak for for Cat. I don't know how to use these things, but you uh, you will only have to do one of those. So uh, there is a website for the class, and this is me pointing out that it is not. Uh, I tried to make the slides be phone compatible, since we all do this. So I'm working in a phone aspect ratio for the term. The website does not. So uh, uh, visit that on your computer. That's where all the things for the class will be. Uh, there is a files section. And that is important for two reasons. Uh, reason A is there's an excerpt from The Timeless Way of Building. 
Uh, you don't have to buy the book. You can just use the excerpt, which is great. The other thing is there is a file there called Alexander GSD 1982. Uh, that is a transcript of a speech that he gave at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard uh, that is unpublished. I think it's the best description of this theory in any one place that I've read from all of his work. So that's something a little special that we get to use, that we have permission to use. Um, and then there's a Twitter for the class. Uh, when I post recordings of class sessions and slides and things, they will all be posted there. And if you have a question about things, you can post them there. The slides are going to be on the Twitter site, you said? Like yes, uh, they will be. I will post links to them on the Canvas site. And when the Canvas site is updated, I'll use Twitter as the notification for the... Uh, yeah, that'll be all the things. There'll be emails, there'll be, uh, we should start a Slack maybe. There'll be all the things. Um, yeah, communication via Twitter, announcements via Twitter. Sometimes I will do announcements via Wolverine Access also, especially now that, who here was using the, act, the different uh, authentication method last year that's different than the one they use now? The M token thing and all that? It is so much better, it, oh, it's so great now. So I'm, I never used Wolverine Access before because it was so hard to get into. Now they've made it so easy, I might send emails through that too. Dan, do you know that Canvas has an app as well? Oh, jeez. Can you make it fit your phone aspect ratio? Well, I have a Windows phone, so they probably don't have an app. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I want to understand what makes things in space be good. And I have been to places like here in Venice that are really old that had hundreds and hundreds of people who were the authors of them. And these are good. Um, here are these amazing films by this weird American guy. And they have, I, I'm telling you, this, it, I don't think it's that big of a stretch that spaces that we love, that what makes them be what they are, do to us what they do to us, that that isn't what's going on. I mean, look at the, uh, the, ge the geometry of this, the situatedness of this point in the story, of this character in the little line that you could draw, of the ups and downs of his story relative to the other characters, relative to, uh, there's just so many ways I think that we can uh, take something that claims to be a system for understanding this and then use it to understand uh, this, and then maybe at last then have something that we would know about uh, this. Uh, this is a picture that my friend David took on Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, they get internet up there. Uh, the average amount of time that Americans spend uh, doing this, 40 hours a month, and we are, Americans are behind many other parts of the world. Uh, Apple, a couple of months ago, released a stat 89 times an uh, iPhone user uh, hit, sees the unlock screen in a given day. The stat that I have here is 150 times looking at a smartphone, if you have one, a day. So why would it matter so much? Uh, I, I'll just, you'll learn this soon enough, but I'll, uh, long story short is, I think almost everything on these screens is crap. It's all terrible. I've been doing this for 20 years and it does not feel like 20 years of experience. It feels like the same year 20 times in a row. And that isn't, uh, this is starting to be important. Uh, back in the day when it was ordering t-shirts, uh, I know how to make a website sell more t-shirts, and that's great. <laughs> uh, but I want them to be, I, we're living in these places, I want them to be good, and somebody has to do research, somebody has to investigate what do we already know about places that need to be good for people, uh, rather than boiling the ocean. I'm sure there's lots of ways uh, in an iSchool we could do research to figure out how to make these be good places for people. Uh, but they let me pick what we do in here. <laughs> so until they stop that or somebody were to say, hey, here's the curriculum, 
here's the way that information architecture fits into what SI wants you to know in the world. Uh, maybe part of the reason that that argument hasn't had to happen yet is because the value of this still isn't, uh, isn't clear. The value of information architecture, if it's this important, how come it's not in everything? Um, maybe the, we're asking the wrong question and it's not information architecture, it's architecture. And architecture in places where there is complex information uh, that need to be good for people. That's a different question. So you may not be interested in that question. I guarantee you my interest in that question will uh, propel us at least through 13 weeks. Um, this is set up for everybody to get all the points. So it's mostly are you willing or uh, skeptical about uh, how valuable is this, how mappable is this into the world of the little rectangles. Um, but believe me, I care deeply about that world of the re little rectangles. I just don't think starting there and spending our time there uh, is what every class at SI ought to be. Yes? When you say the space on our phone is crap, could you elaborate on what makes it crap? Uh, well, one of the ways that I've started to do that is by taking a, a list of like those principles. Uh, the situatedness of those things, uh, especially, oh man, what's the... Uh, the worst one, and I, I thought the students last term would get at this. Um, they mocked me in the final presentation. Uh, like, we don't know what the fuck to do with that. Um, I wanted to reverse engineer a rationale for why is the shuffle button the biggest button in the key? Music is like the most important thing that I do on my, like I never answer my phone. Uh, <laughs> the most important experience I have digitally is music. I paid the top, the, you can't pay them more. <laughs> like if there was like a little box, oh, five dollars to remove the shuffle play button, I would play it. Or I wouldn't shuffle it, I would pay it. Um, this, why this? On what basis can I say this is less good than it should be? Um, you know, we could usability test this thing or do a, a ethnographic study of me and how often I shuffle, which is exactly zero times ever. Uh, I pride myself on being a DJ of my own soundtrack to my life. Like, I ju it just isn't for me. And so finding a way beyond my personal preference to explain how could this be better? Um, if we started by asking uh, of the situatedness of the elements, we could just start moving them around and say, if I do it like this, does that feel more like how being connected to everything good in the world ever would be? Uh, I'm certain that those were not questions that anybody was asking. And it sounds quite goofy to say you would be using that mirror of self-test uh, to make choices like that, but that's, that's one of the places that this goes, is saying uh, you don't need an expert, you don't need a... Uh, Somebody from, from one of the big three auto industries showed my partner and I yesterday, my business partner, what $2 million of research looks like. What the findings for $2 million of user research into the dashboard of cars looks like. This way, this is saying you don't, I guess you could boil the ocean and talk to a gajillion people and extract all of what they think good is and then make a model of that and then do the weightings and then try to shake, okay, tell us what good means, people. Um, what this is saying is that you already know. It used to be that all of the things that people had in their everyday life were made by people. <laughs> that just, it's, it may not be, uh, this might not be interesting to you, but that took a little while to work on me. We couldn't make this building, us. Uh, there's a TED talk about algorithms and how we don't know what they are doing. The building construction system for this, there are parts of it we actually don't really understand. They just get reified, they just happen. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of expertise that you can use to uh, critique something like this. We could use Jacob Nielsen and Ralph Molich's 
uh, heuristics for human usability, to look at the relative size of the buttons, the amount of thumb travel for task completion. There are all sorts of ways we could drop a Cartesian net over this, break it into little parts, and try to figure out why is this not as good as it should be. And uh, that, again, that ain't what we're going to do in here. What we're going to do in here is uh, having the audacity to think, well, uh, I, we already know what would be good to do here. We just have to slow down enough to uh, be considerate. And uh, there are some really helpful things we can use about geometry. And, uh, and by uh, being able to move these things around and ask which arrangement gets it closer to something that is alive, uh, that we can make it better. And, uh, and that that would apply to anything. Yes? I don't think that there are any of those. So no, uh, that's the experimental nature of this is not having antecedents that I'm aware of, but again, you will be learning uh, what is the nature of this order. You will have a hand list of at least some of its geometric properties. Uh, if you start being turned on to, if you're aware of things in the built environment of apps and websites and information space, uh, that are like this, please. <laughs> uh, and and, and I'm, I'm stealing some of the thunder from the next two lectures, but uh, one of the reasons why I feel pretty confident in saying that is that uh, all of this stuff is not posited as the secret knowledge that only the sweet, awesome people, if you know the right things and have the right beliefs and rub the guru on the right part, um, this is supposed to be the ordinary way. This is supposed to be workaday, practical as heck, and f completely freeing us from practicality as the governing principle. This is saying beauty, wholeness, and life as the governing principle. And if that means going slower, okay. If that means it costs more, okay. Uh, part of the reason why these teachings have never been taken seriously in digital is because they sound like they take too much time and cost too much. And they probably do. Yeah? Can I ask a question about the pictures we were looking at? Of the buildings? Sure. So we, we talked briefly and you were like, so which one feels, and we're talking about like building good ordered spaces, uh -huh. building good spaces. But like, in addition to their aesthetics, both of these buildings have, they, they come out of histories, like genealogies. So this one is a modernist building. Modernism, why did it emerge? World War II was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so people are trying to rationalize their way, like build rational things and hope that it creates a built environment, you know, to counter this gruesome, horrible experience in history. Whereas the next one is also like, I don't know the history of this, I actually went on a boat tour this one came first. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, in, in any case, the, the like, modernist tradition goes back to World War I. Yep. And then this one is a slightly different take. It's also modernist in that it's subtle, and it's repeating, and so on. But like, can we then approach things and say, what is beautiful? Or can I make something and be like, what is most beautiful to me? And then not take, pay attention to like my own historically informed and culturally informed ways of doing that, is it possible to find like one essential thing and be like, oh, this is what's... I guess it's hard for me to understand. Like, I wouldn't be able to critique the aesthetics of both these buildings without understanding their genealogies and where they were coming from. Yeah, and I think it's not meant so much to be an aesthetic judgment. Uh, so I think the initial judgment is both of these are ghastly, inhuman uh, machine uh, attacks on the places that people are, need to live. And neither of these are good for people. Um, so what this nature of order, this uh, theory 
uh, provides is a way to use the comparison to get at what is uh, not aesthetic, but what is the... Uh, this amount of metal and glass ought never be brought together on the side of a river in Illinois, but given that you've done that, that there are uh, ways of going about this with its purpose, uh, with its inhabitants, with all of the project participants, uh, that would be more alive. But it would never be built because this theory says anything that people can't make, like us. So four stories is as tall as anything I've ever ought to be, as far as this is concerned. Which is, again, you know, completely preposterous, impractical. You couldn't have cities at the level of density that is necessary. Um, and then the argument would be, yes, at the level of density necessary for a humanity-crushing uh, collusion of capital and uh, uh, some other bad thing. <laughs> that that's why we have these. Um, uh, Denise Scott Brown, one of my favorite architects, uh, form doesn't follow forces, form follows finance. There is a way to turn this square into money, and uh, this is one of the ways. Yes? If something achieves wholeness, is it then beautiful? Yes. And if something is alive, it is beautiful and whole. And if something is whole, then it is that that triad is always how it works. And that was part of his reticence. It was uh, the quality without a name for a time. But things exist that are beautiful that are whole, yet they're so beautiful. No. The theory is anything that's beautiful is whole and alive. Okay. I think you said earlier you couldn't think of any example that existed. Maybe it was just in the digital domain that were beautiful. Yeah. Using that, again, uh, isolating beauty, aesthetically, like wicked, like the best Swiss design imaginable, yeah. Um, Snowfall, the New York Times story from a couple of years ago now. For a long time, I thought that that was the bee's knees. Um, but that's, that can't be done the ordinary way. The digital report that came out from the people who made that, they're like, that was the worst thing that happened. That raised everybody's expectation that you can just like poop out uh, digital journalism that's that amazing, and that story had way too much you know, budget, time, can't be built in the CMS. Um, so no, if the standard, again, this is not to say, uh, I'm going to sort through the things that are more and less aesthetically pleasing. This is from this weird standard, and uh, this is part of what could be considered rhetorical dishonesty. Uh, the ability to be manipulating that as well. Yeah, you like that, but it isn't good because it doesn't hold up to this uh, precious thing that I have. Uh, I've moved the goalposts in a way where the things that you like would never measure up and the things that I love always do. Uh, that's one of the critiques of this. Yes? So, I guess at the beginning you said that there's space to disagree or challenge this. And yes. I'm talking about different aspects of it. Yes. I, I too identify with some of the kind of anthropologically informed concerns, specifically any theory of beauty is like super broad. Um, so I guess, I guess I'm wondering, is there a way to like, do you feel like there's space within the way you envision this course to agree with the premise that there are patterns that are on related ways and that it's important to, to look at those, look at those relationships, but then not take it those extra steps to think about, like, you can use this to appraise something. Because I, I think that this can be used situationally to think about any given moment or scene or thing, like how the elements are interacting, but I definitely struggle to see how that can build to something sustainable about beauty, for example. I think we need as much skepticism as can be brought okay. and uh, utter skepticism, not even willing to go to the point of uh, that there are inherencies that are correlate with beauty that seem to be factual. Uh, if you can't go there, you are welcome, if not necessary, because this is investigation. This is not, uh, this would be. Uh, a failure if this is just me uh, making you do stuff that I'm interested in. Um, because I'm not interested in this coming up uh, lemons. 
I, I would be sad if part of what we learn in here is that uh, this order may be operative on buildings, but it is uh, useless for describing films and that the linkages between the information space of film and the kinds of information spaces that we work in are tenuous at best. Uh, that would make me sad, but I'm telling you that's with, all within the realm of what's possible. It has to be in order for this to be an honest investigation. Uh, the outcomes are not, uh, I don't have a foregone conclusion. I, uh, I want my side to win. <laughs> yes? Um, some of the, like I know there have probably been published articles critiquing uh, Alexander's theory, um, kind of for actually kind of a Cartesian kind of like object pretension to like being objective. Is that going to be incorporated in the course at all? Not so much. This is mostly taking it at as stated and then putting banging it, banging around on it um, at a level of remove from interfaces because I think, and this is this is the probably the sketchiest part of all of this. Uh, I think doing it at a level of remove from interfaces will be better than if we were trying to do it with interfaces. We've actually done it with. Uh, Last term, all of the groups were focused on music services, Tidal, Spotify, Apple Music. Um, and it's too easy to uh, phone in an HCI critique uh, at any given point when you're looking at rec rectangles and interfaces and stuff. Not that anybody phoned it in, um, but it's just too, it's, it's, so I think the fact that we're not working on interfaces is going to make it even better for interfaces if certain things prove to be true, which they may not. <laughs> Boy, I'm not selling this as well as I thought I would. Yes. <laughs> like usually I don't want to sell this and, and I kind of do want to sell it this time. So I'm, I'm here in myself and remembering the last few sales conversations I was in actually. <laughs> Yep. How do you make that argument saying, no, we're not going to talk about interfaces, we're going to talk about this out there theory of wholeness and the search for beauty? How is that productive for someone who wants to be a designer or product engineer? Um, it will be most useful if you find yourself in contexts where solving the problem isn't the only thing you're valued for. And that is usually not first year out of master's program place. So the, the when do you get to tap the value of this? Uh, if it's mostly, hey, smart person, go solve a problem. And if there isn't space in there for you to ask fundamental questions, um, the way that this idea is set up is wrong. That's what I want to give you the ability to do. The situatedness of these ideas is fucked up, you guys. Uh, they don't want to come together this way. And here are some suspicions, here are some trajectories of why, why this isn't going to work. Um, there's got to be a reason for this. <laughs> and I bet it gets to the conceptual, the situatedness of the concept of how this thing is used. No. Nope. No. This is uh, demo love. This is somebody designed a pretty UI, knew there needed to be a big ass green button, and figured we'll back the function into it once we make it. And there's a sprint two weeks from now that can deliver whatever's not that, if not that isn't what we want. But until we A, B, C, D test this, uh, it seems to be fine. People don't click on it, but it seems to be fine. Yes? I wanted to offer a comment. Is there a reason why I think this is valuable? So I think that one of the things I've gotten out of Sil is that I do not love that Alexander. <laughs> I do not love his series. But I think that it's really useful, and I think it's useful in IA to be able to set aside a uh, truth and a cosmology and um, understand what's true and what's and I think that that ends up being part of your work, that whatever space you're entering into, whether that's a, a 
business or a non-profit or someone has this great idea, it has its own truth and the users have a truth and being able to set aside and really engage with it and say, um, like, what does this mean here and how can we talk it today? It's been useful for me. And I think that like that Spotify interface, I've found more and more interfaces look like actual prototypes to me. And I really feel like I can tell the way everybody's learning to design rectangles and actual is making all of my interfaces and every website that's got a new fresh new update. I'm like, oh yeah, it looks like a wireframe. Um, and that this is sort of a way to engage different people and say, well, what's true in a space? And then how could I make something in that space? You sold it way better. <laughs> wow, yes. I have one more question. So yes. I actually, I love classes where you focus on what there is. And a lot of ways to do this. You're learning to use a tool. You're learning to put on like, somebody else's goggles. But goggles are always like very specifically good at some things. And not always good at everything. It's like two different things, right? Yep. So are we going to, my question is, like, are we leaving Alexander into a history of like, Field or like, is there a way to like throw in? I, I don't know. I just want to know like, what is this guy used for? What isn't he used for? How do like what problems does he doesn't he solve? I guess we'll be exploring that ourselves. But. Yeah, we will. But the short answer is my desire to have more time in the conducting of investigation and analysis and creating tests, um, and you all just uh, receiving the context of uh, everybody hates this guy in his field, and it'll become clear why, I think. But no, no time for the, here is the, uh, the speech that we have the transcript of that we're using from the archives. There was a debate the day after that speech between Christopher Alexander and uh, Peter Eisenman. And uh, I have thought many times about having a course on that uh, duality. The, uh, Eisenman was accused by Alexander of his ways of working and thinking, screwing up the world. And uh, I think that these are so, uh, Alexander has been so ornery and uh, not interested in, uh, it's not that he's not interested in an honest collision between these ideas. I think it's more that he can't, uh, I don't think he thinks the other way is worth debating. So he's reviled in part because he's an, ide an ideologue. He's a, uh, uh, the lunatic of one idea in a world of ideas. He's not willing to have a conversation on the basis, uh, the hypothetical basis that we mo both might be equally correct. He hasn't, uh, his rhetoric has not been rendered that way. And that's one of the reasons why I had been hesitant for a long time to even engage with it because there's something uh, uh, what's the word? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a problem. It's uh, but if it's true that it is on the basis of a cosmology that is not shared with the other points of view, the refusal to compare apples and oranges may not be uh, complete asshole behavior. It may be uh, just not wanting to engage in hypotheticals because these are not the same thing. Probably the closest that we'll get in uh, the course to the opposite of this is the story of building this high school and how uh, System B tried to change the way that uh, this place was being built. But uh, of course it's written by the proponents of what is offered as System A.
you all have submitted some questions, and uh, I would like to go over some of those if you would like to do that uh, with me. And then uh, I would like to have you meet each other. Uh, there is a grouping that you have for the property, so I'd like you to briefly, uh, I want to see who you are and see you recognize each other, and we'll figure out a little bit of who's here and who's not here through that, and then uh, also get the uh, four main groups together also. So, uh, but before we do that, we can take a break and then do questions. Come back when the big hand is on the eight. Ten minute break. <laughs> <laughs>